Hey, today and next week, I want to talk about the idea, I want to talk about this subject, money matters. How many know money really does matter? Some of you look like you're, you're surprised. <laughs> no, no, think about this. When we look at the biggest concerns in our life, usually some of the biggest concerns of our life revolve around money. If we're a young person, you know, we might be hoping that we have enough money for diapers. We might be hoping that we have enough money for getting into school or paying off, God bless, the student loan. Uh, you know, we're just hoping that we have enough money for that or maybe just being able to get into buying our first home. So money becomes a big concern as we're starting out our life. But also as we're getting near retirement years, we hope, okay, I hope I've saved enough. I, I hope I've got enough money stored up for my future so that I don't have to be nervous and freaked out. And then in the middle between that, just there's everyday life. And we hear about things like inflation. How many, how many like inflation? Any, any fans of inflation? Anybody here not affected by inflation? All right, we, we get impacted by it. And, and, then, and then we pull up to the gas pump right? So the thing is, money affects all of our lives. And, and no matter how much of a mentalist we might want to be, we might to say, no, money's not a big deal to me. Listen carefully. When you have a lack of money in your life, we struggle and suffer more. Uh, money allows us to have a level of comfort. And when we lack it, we struggle. On the other end, when we have money, but we are not wise with it, it can mess up our minds. We can get emotionally and mentally all nervous about how we steward money and how we manage money. And you might not realize this, but the Bible actually has a lot to say on the subject of money and money management. That's why we're going to talk about this. There's actually over 2,300 references in Scripture on this particular subject matter because it integrates all of our life. But what we're really talking about what we're really talking about is the idea of biblical stewardship. And, and I want you to understand this. I want to break this down. Biblical stewardship is, is a, a phrase that many of us don't necessarily understand, but it's the, it's the idea that every good thing in my life, every good thing in my life comes into my life as a gift from God. And, and, it's, and it's bigger than just money. Every good thing in my life comes into my life because it's a gift from God. And... And, and how many know that your spouse is a gift from God? Somebody say, well, then God don't like me very much. <laughs> but we call, we call our spouse what? Our spouse. But do you realize that your spouse is God's daughter or God's son? And so, so you don't own your spouse, even though we claim ownership. We don't own them. They're a gift from God. How many call our children our children? These are my children. But do you realize they're not really your children from a biblical perspective, from God's perspective. They're his kids. And some of you need to realize that God loves your kids more than you realize. Some of us, we worry and stress because we think, God, you don't love my kids as much as I love my kids. And God says, no, I love, they're my kids. They're not your kids. They're my kids. And some of us need to learn how to trust God in parenting our children because we feel like we're doing it without God. And that's the whole point I'm getting into with stewardship here. You know, there's gifts and talents that come into your life that, that, that God expects us to be stewards of them. And so there's these things that come into our life. Every good thing that comes into your life is a gift from God, and it's to be stewarded. And that simply means to be managed, which means I have to understand I'm not the owner of my spouse some of you need to figure that out. That would help you out in your marriage. I'm not the owner of my children. I'm not the owner of my own life. I'm not the owner of my gifts, talents, and ability. Uh, I'm not the owner of my money. Every good thing that comes into my life, I'm only a steward of it. And stewardship means I recognize that good comes into my life from a source. I manage what's been given to me. And then I'll give an account for it. You know, the Bible says that you will actually give account for every word that you speak. That's a high level of accountability. God, 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 is, God is into meticulous accounting here. And so I'll give account for my gifts and talents and ability, what I did with my life. I'll give it because it's not my life. 
you, you, I need to realize this is not my life. The, my life has been bought and paid for by Christ. My life belongs to him. So every good thing comes in. I get to manage it. Then I get to give an account for it. So one small sliver of what we're talking about in biblical stewardship relates to one area, and that area is money. It's just one of many areas in the concept of biblical stewardship. Does that make sense? And so biblical stewardship then is this something that's, that wants you to understand that here's number one. First thing I want you to get is that money, money from a biblical stewardship is spiritual. Money has a spiritual implication to it. Yes, it has a natural purpose. Yes, we take care of natural things with it. But you'll see as we go through this, there's also a very important spiritual connection that if I don't make, see, if I don't make the connection, let me go back. If I don't make the connection that my wife is God's daughter, let me explain this. It's because when I go to pray to God and complain about my wife, he reminds me, you're talking about my daughter. Jeez, that's a problem. When, when, I, when, I, when I talk about complaining about something, I have to realize that most of the stuff that I might want to complain about, I'm really talking to God about what's his, not what's mine. And, and, so, and so, so money is a spiritual thing, and, and yes, it has practical, natural purposes, but it's a spiritual application. And Scripture says this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So money, money, how I handle it will reveal the desires of my life. How I handle and how I manage the money that comes into my life is going to reveal some of the desires of my life. But not only that, Money's also how I relate to it, how I relate to it is going to reveal, uh, determine how I relate to my relationships. For example, husbands and wives get married, and wife wants to express money because it comes as a desire. How we manage it, how we handle it is expressed through our desires. Wife wants to do it one way, husband wants to do it another way. How many know it's going to affect the relationship? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? One wants to save it, one wants to spend it. That's the desires manifesting. Then how we handle it, how we handle it will affect the relationship. Or both want to spend it, but they want to spend it on different things. Or both want to save it and save it for different things. So you got all kind of combinations, and so now you're in relationships. So money, money reveals the desires in my heart, but not only that, money will impact how I relate in relationships with other people. And, 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 and I want you to think about this. Think carefully about this. Money, money is not life. Jesus was very clear and emphatic that life does not consist of the abundance of the things we possess. But money and life are so integrated together, I challenge you to try to divorce them. I'll break this down. Money and life are, again, life is not money. But try to have a life without money. Did you catch it? So, for example, for example, we go to work. Anybody here going to work? Yeah, most of you probably go to work. You go to work and you give your time. You give your time. And when you give your time, you're giving your life, technically, right? Your life is in your time. And so you're giving your life for a job so that that job will do what? Compensate you or give you money. I'm giving you my time. I'm giving you my life so that you will give me money. When you give me that money, I'm going to accessorize and enhance my life with the money you've given me. And, 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 the words, and it's not a bad thing. In other words, I'm looking around and all of you have been accessorized. You've got clothes on. Right? You got some clothes on. You've accessorized yourself. You know, you put some shoes on. You, you put some stuff on. You've accessorized yourself. You, you, you might have had a, a, a cup of coffee today. You, you might have had some food today. You, you might have taken a shower today. And, and, and what, how did you do all of those things that relate to your life? They required money to do them. So you had money to accessorize your life. But not only that, if I have a lot of money, I can enhance my life. I, I can have nicer clothes if I, if I want to spend my money on that. I can have a nicer car, and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, can, I can, you know, how many know where you sit in life matters? 
you fly planes, you can sit in the middle seat, or you can sit in first class, right? And I mean, no, it, but what's the difference? What's the difference between the middle seat and first class? Money or, 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 or status points where you get promoted anyway. So money, money allows us to enhance our life. So, 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 and, and, and so we go through life, and money gives us the ability to have an answer for things. It gives us the ability to speak into things. And so it becomes this spiritual matter. But then Jesus goes on to say something very interesting in, 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 in Matthew chapter 6 here. Look what he says. Jesus gives money a personality. I want you to think about this. People can get in relationships with things that are not alive. People can get in relationship with objects and things. And here's what it says. No one can serve two masters. No one can have two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve, you cannot serve both God and money. Are you catching this? You, you can't serve both. So he's given it a personality. He's actually, actually given it a, a, a status of a deity. How many know that money can deeply affect and impact how we live our lives? Money can have an incredible impact on the destiny of so many things that we do with our life. And Jesus is saying that money, money is his competition in our lives. Money is, money is what God is saying, either you will trust me or you will trust money. That's why it's a spiritual matter. Okay, you're awful quiet. It's like, wow, why did I come to church today for? Man, I came to, I came to be encouraged. Really, this, this is a really encouraging message if you, can, if, you can, if you can really hear it. Because money comes into your life and money will go out of your life. You and I get to decide money's purpose. Here's what he's saying. Either I serve money or money will serve me. Either I serve money or money will serve me. And here's the other part I want to mention to that because we, we, because we, we, say, we say, here's the misconception, that if I have enough money, God becomes unnecessary. If I have enough money, money will take care of me. If I have enough money, I can secure my future. If I have enough money, I can accessorize my life. If I have enough money, I can enhance my life. And if I have enough money, then money will free me. How many know if you had, if you had money, how many know if you had a lot of money, how many wouldn't go to work this week? Money would free me because, again, when I want to enhance and accessorize my life and I don't have enough money, what do we do? We do things like get in debt. Do, do you know what the word, you know where the word mortgage comes from? Anybody got a mortgage on their house? You know where the word mortgage comes from? The word mort is death. It is a debt till you die. That's, what, that's literally what a mortgage means. It's like we will put you in, we'll give you a 30-year mortgage. 30-year mortgage. We're going to give you a debt till you die. Anybody paid off their mortgage? <laughs> No, you should not be shy. If you paid it off, say praise the Lord, because doesn't that feel good? Come on, somebody. It's like we're all jealous for you. You prayed that thing off. Praise the Lord. The only question I got is why do we have to still pay property tax after we pay off our mortgage, right? You know, that's, that's a whole other issue right there. If I, if I ever went into politics, that would be my issue. It's like when people retire, they should get up, you shouldn't have to keep paying on the house they've already paid off. It's like how many times do I have to pay off my house? Right? Right? But, but if we don't go into mortgage, if we, if we can't get the debt, then we might even start stealing, lying, cheating. And that's what Jesus is saying. Money becomes this spiritual matter in our life that can affect our relationships. It can affect our character. It can affect our decision making. It can affect how we relate to God. And so he says money can be his competition in our life because it's easier to say, I trust money because money makes God unnecessary. If I have it, God, you're unnecessary. Or, or, God, I know you're important, but I'm so busy chasing my career. I'm so busy earning my wealth. I'm so busy gathering my resources. I don't have time to seek you. I don't have time to know you. And, and, and should I ever get in a place where my money doesn't help me, I'll come and find you. I'm sick with a disease my money can't fix. Can you help me? 
I'm living in a beautiful house, but now my spouse wants to leave. Can you help me? I, 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 I give my kids the best education, but they're choosing to live a crazy addicted lifestyle, and money can't fix it. Now, God, can you help me? So, God, when I got re reduced to where money could not save me, I'll turn to you, and now will you save me? And God is saying, it don't work that way. It don't work that way. God will... How many would be honest and say, I came to God at the highest point in my life? Marriage was working. Career was working. I'm healthy, strong. Life is so good. And I thought, you know, you know what's missing in my life? I need God. I've been pastoring a church for 30-some years now. I've never heard somebody say, everything's so good in my life, I'd, I'd realize I needed God. But I have met a lot of people who are broken, hurting, in crisis, in desperation, and say, could God help? And God will always help. But we usually don't come to him at the peak of our life. We come to him at the broken part of our life. And that's why he says, you can't serve two masters. Because if you serve that master, here's number two, money can't be trusted. Money can't can't be trusted. It's an important part of our life. It surrounds all of our life. But if we put our trust in it, we're going to be disappointed. If, in fact, let me say it this way, because we're talking about stewardship. If you put your trust in anything other than God, you'll be disappointed. If you put your trust in man, the Bible says you'll be disappointed. If you put your trust in yourself, you will be disappointed. If you put your trust in anything other than God, you and I will be disappointed. And listen to this verse. Listen to this verse out of Proverbs. Tell me, tell me if you find this to be true. In Proverbs, it says, for riches certainly make themselves wings, and they fly like an eagle towards heaven. How many, how many feel like that when you pull up to the gas pump? It's like, my mind's just flying away right now. How many of you, look, over the last year, some of you might be thinking about retirement, and, and you, you quit looking at, at your retirement portfolio because the stock market's kept going down and down. It's like, I don't even want to look at it right now, you know, because it just got so depressing because you're watching your money fly away and and you're like you know and i actually i actually heard this i was reading in the news recently that that there are people who have retired and had a retirement plan and the retirement plan was going well and then all of a sudden the economy started going down and they had to start going back and taking second jobs because they realized they were not going to have enough money in their retirement so they had enough money but then their money flew away so now they had to go back into the workforce to augment their income because they had a plan but apparently money disappointed them because it just flew away. Or remember the old phrase, real estate never goes down. And yes, we're at record real estate prices right now. But in 2008, because you've heard it, real estate never goes down. Real estate never goes down. In 2008, it went down. It went way down. I know people who lost fortunes during that time. I'm talking about fortunes of, of real estate because it went so far down. I actually bought my house when the real estate went down, so praise the Lord. You know, amen. Yeah, yeah, I can tell you praise the Lord for that. But, 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 the, my point is money can get wings and fly away. It can, it can depart and leave out of our lives. And here's the, here's, the, here's the misbelief. Here's the misbelief. That money, money gives me freedom. Money gives me more freedom. And, and yes, there's a lot of ways that money does give us freedom. Money gives us a lot of freedom. In other words, money's like faith works this way. When you have money, you can go places. How, how, many, how many don't go places because you don't have money? It's like, there, how many would say, there are some places I would like to go, but I can't go there because I don't have money. Faith will take you places. Money also says, but not only when you get there, you can do stuff. It's like, you, you don't want to just get off the plane at the airport someplace. It's like, no, I need a hotel. I need travel. I need some food to eat. Uh, you know, there's some things I want to do. So money allows you to do things when you get there. So money will take you places and money will let you do things. You know, faith does the same thing. Money will take you, faith will take you places and faith will allow you to do things. And so understand this is, becomes the competition for God in our life. And so the belief is that money, money will cause me to have freedom. But in the gospel story, of the rich young ruler found in Mark. It's in your outline. I'll just highlight it for you. In that story, money did not bring his freedom. Money brought his bondage. Let me say it again. Money did not bring freedom. Money brought bondage. In this story, if, you, if you're familiar with it, we call it the story of the rich young ruler. This young man, he comes up to Jesus one day and he says, good master, what do, must I do to inherit eternal life? And this is a spiritually hungry young person. He's a good guy. 
he's calling Jesus, Jesus good. And Jesus makes his comments, why do you call me good? There's none good but God alone. And, and you understand, in the Hebrew mindset, no one was considered good but God. And G this young man is calling Jesus good. And he says, are you calling me good because you know who I am? Do you recognize who you're talking to? And that was Jesus' statement. Why do you call me good? Are you just making a statement of courtesy? Or do you recognize who you're talking to? And he goes on. Jesus said, well, you know the commandments. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Don't murder. And he lists out all the commandments. And, and the young man says, I've kept all of these from my youth. It's a spiritually hungry guy. He's, he's seeking God. And the Bible says, then Jesus looked at him and asked him to do the unimaginable. He says, you have a problem. There is one thing you lack. You need to go sell. Now, Jesus don't know that he's rich. Naturally, there's, there's no reason to say, hey, I'm rich. No. But the Bible says, Jesus said to him, you lack one thing. You need to go sell what you have, give it away, and come and follow me. And the Bible says the young man walked away because he had great possessions. His money caused him to pass up the invitation of a lifetime. Here is Jesus himself standing in front of him. Jesus said, follow me to only a few people. Specifically, follow me to the disciples. This is the 13th person Jesus said, follow me. This is what the Bible teaches. I'm just going to inject a thought in it. Of the 12 people that were following Jesus, one of them was Judas. You know what Judas's problem was? Money. What did, Jesus, what did Judas sell Jesus out for? Money. What was Judas in charge of? The money. What did Judas argue about Jesus for? How to use the money and spend the money because he didn't care about people. He was a thief, the Bible says. And is it possible that Jesus was inviting this young man, if he could pass the test of trust, to maybe replace Judas on his team. It's not in the Bible. It's just a thought. Because money is a test of where I will put my trust. And money cannot be trusted. So, look, in fact, in fact, his money caused him to depart. Look what the Bible says here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, in verse 10. It says, for the love of money, not money, not money, but the love of money, the love of money. I've known people with a lot of money that are not in love with it. And I've known people with no money that are desperately in love with it. It's not about how much affluence you have, but it's about your, whether you love it or don't love it. And it says, so for the love of money, for the love of money, it's the root of all kind of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith, pierced himself with many griefs. The love of money caused him what? To depart from what? Trusting in God. And cause them to pierce themselves. Self, have you ever had a self-inflicted wound? Yeah, come on. Remember, let's go back to what I said earlier. Because you're all looking really loud right now. <laughs> money reveals the desires of my heart. And money will influence how I hit, handle relationships. And many people, money can sabotage our marriage. Sabotage our relationships. Impact our lives. And we can cause ourselves to get into trouble. And that's what the scripture says, causes them to depart. And that's what was happening with this young man. But now let's go back. I'll go back to the story in Mark chapter 10 of the young man. So when Jesus said this to, this, to them, he, he makes this statement, a very powerful statement. He goes, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples, the Bible says, were astonished. It's like, what are you talking about? He explains it. He says, those who put their trust in their riches... When you put your trust in your riches, it's, it's nearly impossible. It's impossible to enter the kingdom of God. And then they say, well, how can that be? And then he explains to them, with God, all things are possible. Then he gives them this analogy. He goes, there is no one who has left houses, lands, father, mother, brother, sister, wives, children, for my sake and the gospel, who will not receive in this lifetime a hundredfold houses, then he lists the, everything back out. Let me, let me clarify that. When God asks us to surrender our trust to him, 
He's not trying to take something away from us. He's trying to replace what we put our trust in. Oh, you're, you need to hear this. He's not trying to take... In other words, he's not... In other words, he said, in this lifetime, I will bless you with whatever you give up. But there has to be this willingness to sit there and say, God, where my trust is at. Because does, does, does God, when you look at the totality of Scripture, does God ask us to abandon our families? No, no, no. In fact, I'm supposed to lay my life down for my family. When, when we look at Scripture, does God want me to forsake my children? No, he wants me to be a plugged-in father. Does God want me to, to neglect my wife? No, he wants me to, to love my wife as Christ loved the church. So when you have to look at the totality, here's what he's saying is, David, don't put your trust in your children. Don't put your trust in your spouse. Don't put your trust in your money. Don't put your trust in your career. Put your trust in me. Oh, you're not, not catching this. Put your trust in me. So because money is not trustworthy. And so here's the third thing. Here's the third thing. When it comes to money matters, when it comes to money matters, generosity is the key to transferring my trust back to God. Generosity is the key to sitting there saying, God, because the choice becomes, when it comes to stewardship, who am I going to trust? Am I going to trust my wealth, which makes me say, God, you're not necessary, or am I going to say, God, I trust you? And so in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, a few verses later, and from and it says, it says, command, and it used this word command twice. Any military in here? So we got some soldiers in here, retired soldiers. Yeah. Let, let me ask you this question. When, when you get a command, what do you do? You follow it. You carry it out. So here's what it's saying. Command, command, command those who are rich in this present world. In other words, some of you are like, well, that lets me off the hook. I'm not rich because <laughs> this verse isn't for me. No. If you are an American, chances are you're more wealthier than you realize. L let me say that again. S in a few minutes, we're going to end service, and some of you are going to go to your car, and you and your spouse are going to start fussing over where you want to go eat. <laughs> that is a rich person's problem. Some of you ladies went to your closet this morning, and you got all stressed out over what to accessorize yourself with. That is a rich person's problem. Some of you pulled up to the gas station in your car and complaining about the gas you're putting in your car that you paid for. That is a rich person's problem. Let's think of it. It's not to make you feel bad. This is to, because it's, I'll read the rest of the verse, but it makes, it's to actually help you feel good. One-third of the Earth's planet is estimated to live on less than $2 a day. One-third. Many of us, we don't enjoy the affluence that we have because we want to be more affluent. There's nothing wrong with being more affluent. The problem is, can I enjoy what I have? Because it says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or put their hope or trust in wealth. Next slide, please. which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Let me ask you this. That one-third of the earth population, if they were to take over your life right now and got your annual income, do you think they might just feel like they won the lottery? No, no, you hear this. In other words, God, can I, am I enjoying what I have? God, am I really enjoying what I have? Am I enjoying your provision in my life or am I discontent? It's, there's nothing wrong with wanting to accessorize and enhance your life more. But if that's where my security is coming from, if that's where my hope's coming from, if that's where my peace is coming from, I'm missing the whole important. I'm missing the whole point. God, you are my source. God, I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to trust money. God, money does not make you not necessary. No, God, you are incredibly necessary, not just when I'm broken, but God, when I'm on top. God, help me as I succeed in life and as I prosper in life and as I advance in life. Let me learn to trust you. And may I enjoy, may I enjoy, may I enjoy every good thing in my life. Every good thing that comes into your life is a gift from God. Do you enjoy your gifts? Command those who are rich in this present age not to be uncertain, but trust in 
uh, and everything that, for their enjoyment. Then it gives the second command. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation in the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Here's what he's saying. Here, here, here's the antidote to freeing myself from the trust of riches. The antidote is to do good, to do good, and to be generous. Listen carefully. Life and the fulfillment and the enjoyment in life is not based on what I consume. The enjoyment of life is based on what I produce. My, 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 my life is not enriched by the things I bring into my life. My life is enriched by the things that come out of my life. Oh, some of you need to hear that. Let me say it this way. If I just go into my marriage and all my marriage is all about what my wife can do for me, I'm not going to enjoy my marriage. I don't understand stewardship. But if I go into my marriage to serve my wife and love my wife and lay down my life for my wife. See, marriage is brutal on selfish people. I was created to do good. Oh, you're looking at me. I think some of you are starting to click a little bit. Some of you don't enjoy your jobs because you don't know how to go and serve. You, you don't enjoy life because you don't know how to serve because it's all about what I consume. It's all about how much does for me. And I put my trust in these things. If I could have more of it, then I would be better off. And I want to be more accessorized and I want to be more enhanced. And that's the wrong approach. Jesus said, if you do that, that's your master and I'm not your master. You'll come to me when you need to be rescued. But you don't come to me to lead you. You don't trust me. You trust your wealth. You, you trust these other things because you think life is about consuming. He says, no, command them. Command them. This is your command. Teach them to do something good with their life. No, I promise you, most of us are probably walking around talking about all the people who are messing up my life. And the more you walk around talking about all the people messing up your life, how many lives are you messing up? Because you got the funk all over you. No, no. You exist. You were created to do good. You were created to do good, to be a blessing, and to be generous. That's who, who you were created to be. Then that way they can lay hold of, lay hold of the life that is real life. Then they can transfer. Then they can transfer their trust. They can transfer that trust. So how do we do this? Where do we start? If, I, if I'm going to practice generosity and I'm going to transfer my trust and I'm going to practice this principle of biblical stewardship, and I know this is going to mess with some of you. Where do I do that? It starts with, look at this verse in Proverbs chapter 3. Honor 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 what does honor mean to you what does the word honor mean honor means to give recognition but I like to say it like this honor is to take care of what takes care of you honor is to take care of what takes care of you government was created to take care of us so I should honor government that doesn't mean they're always right I should honor authority because authority was created to take care of me so I honor authority I should honor my wife because my wife takes care of me I should honor you because we work together as a team we should live this life of learning to recognize what takes care of me and if I recognize all the things that come into my life that take care of me then I take care of what takes care of me. Let me say it again. Take care of what takes care of me. Takes care of, to honor is to take care of what takes care of me. You and I should be honoring people. The problem, in, in my opinion, in our culture, in the workforce, in families, of dishonoring attitudes, we don't take care of what takes care of us. In this case, when it refers to money, here's what God says. Honor the Lord with what? This part of your life, we're talking about this specific stewardship is everything, but this we're talking about this one small slice of our life about money. Honor me with your wealth and with the first fruits 
first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim with new wine. The word first fruits is referring to what we would call tithing. Tithe is simply tenth. And it's actually referring to the first tenth. God says it's the first fruit. It's called the first tenth. And this is where it gets really tricky because now it deals with, am I really going to surrender my trust to God in the area of my finances in a real practical, tangible way that says, God, I trust you more than everything else. I will tell you, I enjoy many good things in my life, but for over 40 years of my life, ever since I've been a Christian, I've honored God with the tithe. I sat down and figured it out one day years ago, and I sat down and figured out that the money I spent on booze, the money I spent on drugs, the money I spent on insanity, the money I spent on destroying my life, Tim talked about go to church to get healthier. Tithing was actually less than what I was spending on everything else to destroy myself. But I had to learn to put my trust in God. And, and I, I, I tithed on minimum wage when I was making $2.65 an hour. $2.65 an hour. I tithed on, when I was on unemployment. I've tithed my whole life as a Christian. So what I'm teaching you right now is something, because it's not about money, because had I not learned to tithe, I would have never learned how to enter into the life of faith. I would, have, I would have missed my calling as a pastor. I would have missed my destiny of what God was leading me to be I would have, because I was, not, I was not learning to trust God. Oh, yeah. No, when I walked away from a job that was a very good job, that when I said I'm going to leave, the director of the department came down and says, what are you doing? We were getting ready to promote you. We want you to stay. And I says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go start a church with no people and no money. And and I'm walking away. I walked away from just a few months of being invested in my pension plan, so I cleaned it all out. So I'm talking to you about something that's not about money. If you think it's about money, you're missing the whole point. And it's about stewardship, and it's about learning to live this life of faith and honor the Lord with the first parts of your life, the first fruits. God wants to be first. Do you know, and it's not about money. Do you know God wants to be first in your day? You honor God by giving the first part of your, you honor God by giving the first day of the week. You say, God, I'm going to give you the first of my week. You honor God when you put first in your decision. How many, how many would be honest? We usually go to God after we've already made the decision, and the decision we made was a foolish decision. We say, now, God, I need you to help me fix my decision. And God says, if you would have just honored me by coming to me and say, God, what do you think? I could have saved you a lot of trouble along the way. See, it's learning to honor, to take care of what takes care of me. And God is saying, I take care of you. You think money takes care of you, but you can't trust it. And if you're going to trust me, you're going to have to practice the principle of transferring your trust. And that's through generosity and good deeds. It's by giving your life to me and trusting me financially. Now, there's a tired question. I'm not going to go through this whole lesson because my time's up. But there's a tired question. And the old tired question, if you've been around church a long time, people say, isn't tithing an Old Testament law? Isn't it passed away? We don't have to tithe because that was under the old covenant and we're in the new covenant right now. Another reason I'm saying that because if you go on any kind of social media, if you go on any kind of platform, you're going to hear these kind of voices out there. You're going to hear these kind of messages. And I just felt like it was important to just take a moment and speak to that because, because and here's my thought. You know, I, I don't want anybody to feel pressured into generosity. That, that's not generosity. We don't give, we never give out a pressure. We never give out a manipulation. We never give out a compulsion. But for those who are wanting to understand this biblical principle of giving, then that's why I'm teaching this. So look what, look what Jesus said about this idea of tithing in and, 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 um, Matthew. In Matthew chapter 5, he says, Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. How many know there are practices and purposes? How many would say you go to a job where there are policies and procedures that you don't understand why they're there? You don't understand the why, they're there. You know what the rules are, but you don't know what the heart is. And Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. In other words, I came to take it to the highest level. I came to explain the why. And then if you'll read Matthew chapter 5, which is the Sermon on the Mount, he starts going through these list of statements about the law. He, he, says, he says, you have heard, you have heard that you shall not murder. Anybody guilty of murder? Don't raise your hand if you are. 
Anybody, anybody guilty of murder? No. But then he says, but I say to you, I say to you, the new standard, the new standard, if you have anger in your heart, you're guilty of murder. Ooh, I'm guilty. See, a lot of people like to say the new covenant of grace means it's, it's a lower standard. No, no, no. It, it, the covenant of grace is such a high standard. It will, if you really understand, it'll warp your mind. And they, they said, in the, and, and Jesus said to them, you have heard, you shall not commit adultery. Pretty straightforward, pretty black and white. I'm, on the law side, I'm, I'm good. I'm not murdered, not committed adultery. But they said, but I say to you, the new standard, if you look at someone and lust in your heart, you're guilty. Yikes. In the grace side, I'm 0 for 2. I think I'm probably not the only one over here. He says, you have heard on the law side an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It's like, yes, they deserved it. But I say to you, if someone strikes you on the cheek, give the other. I, I, I say, if they take your coat, give them your tunic. And if they make you walk a mile, then you go too. Get yourself free from revenge and seeking anger and revenge. Are you kidding me, Jesus? I'd rather just slap them back. <laughs> I'm good over there. I'm 0 for 3 over here on the grace side. Over here, he said, he said, you have heard, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. <laughs> we got a piece of cake. It's like, yeah, I love the people you like and hate the people you don't like. I got it. The new covenant, the new standard, the purpose, I say, Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you. It's like, I'm over four. You catching this? And then here's the kicker. Yes, there's something that was passed away in the old covenant. It was the sacrifice of animals. But guess what it was replaced with? The new standard. Jesus said, I'll pay my own life for this grace. Because you are guilty of every charge and the only way you can be free in the new covenant is by my grace and so I will be the sacrifice that an animal can't cover you an animal can't cleanse you an animal can't wash your sin so I will give my own spot sinless spotless free life as the sacrifice the new standard all I'm asking is you'll trust me that you'll trust me and then for those who still say, no, that's, that's not what that's talking about, then let's look at what Jesus said himself. In Matthew, in Matthew 23, woe to you, he, he comes warning against religious people, woe to you, Pharisees, scribes and Pharisees, you're hypocrites. For you pay tithe, and you've got the practice down, and, and, he, and he goes down, you've got, to, you've got this practice way down. You pay tithes of mint, a nice and coming. In other words, <laughs> they're out there counting out the smallest amounts of their, the, the smallest amount of everything. They're, they're going to they're gonna keep the rule. But you have neglected the weightier matters of the law of justice, mercy, and faith. Therefore, you have ought to, therefore, you ought to have done without leaving the other undone. Hear what he's saying. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. You have, you ought to have tithed. But you miss the whole purpose. You miss the whole heart. There's the practice and the principle. There's the practice and the purpose. We don't give because the church needs money. We don't give to get rich. We, we don't give. We give because we're saying, God, I worship you and I trust you and you're my source. God, you're the one that's going to provide for me. You're the one that's going to help me. You're the one that's going to take care of me. Hey, guys, I want to stand to stand your feet and pray for you. I know, I know this is one of those challenging messages. And that's where some of you are at. You're wrestling with this issue. But can I encourage you, wherever you are in your walk with God, God's trying to call you into a life of faith. He's trying to call you into a life of trusting him. I'll say it like this. If God can't trust me with my wealth, where do I trust him? When do I trust him? 
if I can't trust him with the good things in my life, which are actually the result of him bringing them into my life, when and where do I trust him? If God wanted to lead you on this incredible journey of life, and to be able to live out that journey, it would be, require you to live by faith. Do you trust him? If God asks you to do certain things, do you trust him? That's the appeal of this message. It's like, God, I want to be a good steward of everything that you bring into my life. I want to recognize every good thing comes in my life by you. I want to recognize that my job is to manage the good things that come into my life and enjoy them. God wants me to enjoy every good thing that comes into my life. And then, God, I understand that one of these days I will give an account for my life. If you understand that, you understand the concept of stewardship. So I want you to just close your eyes, put your hands on your heart. And I want you to think about your life. I want you to think about where's God calling you to trust him? Where's, where's God saying, don't just need me when you're in crisis. Don't just need me when life is falling apart. Trust me in the good times. Trust me with the good stuff. Trust me with my blessings. Honor me when your marriage is good. Honor me when your children are doing well. Honor me when your health is strong and vibrant. Trust me with your career. Trust me with your time served. Trust me in giving of yourself with good deeds. Trust me, trust me, trust me. I have a plan and purpose for you. I, I want to be your master. I want to be your source. And Father, I just pray that no matter what people are facing in their life, what challenges they're going through, I pray for the blessing of God upon them. I pray for the, the favor of God upon them. If you're here and you don't have a relationship with Christ and, and you, you realize, I need, I need a beginning in God, just open your heart to him. Just simply say, Jesus, I invite you in my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sin and I commit my life to you. If you do that, it's just a simple prayer, but it's, it's in your own words, just invite him into your life to be your Lord and Savior, to be your leader, to be your guide. It's a beautiful journey that begins because it's, it's the journey of faith. And Father, I thank you that you're doing miracles in people's midst. I thank you that you're doing amazing things in their life. I thank you that needs are being met. I thank you lives are being changed. Now, church, we're going to go back into worship, but I'm going to invite our prayer team. And if you're here and you need prayer for anything in your life, you, you've got a decision you need to make then seek God for his wisdom. If you need healing in your body, you know the Bible says that believers lay hands on the sick and they recover. We're believing God for miracles and healing in your body. If you're here and you've got a challenge that you're facing, you need direction, you're struggling with something, you've got a habit you're trying to overcome. My point is simply this, you're here, you're this close. If you need the prayer of agreement, you need, you need prayer. Let us pray for you today. We're believing God to do miracles in our midst because we trust him. So as we go back into worship, you need prayer. I invite you to come forward. Hey, guys, I love you. Let's worship.